Hi, this is Dane Quinn from the University of Akron, and today's video lecture will cover position. So what is position? Well, position describes the location of one point with respect to another. Right, so let's think about a point here. Maybe we'll call that O. And we have a second point up here, and we'll call that A. Then we can draw a position vector from O to A, and define that as R of A with respect to O. Okay, so again, this is the vector that describes the position of A with respect to O. So again, position of A with respect to the point O, commonly referred to as an origin. And this is our notation for this class. Uh, I'll remind you that underbars denote vectors. And then when we define a position, we'll write it as the position of the point slash, or with respect to, the origin O. So now, how are we going to describe this? As we talked about in the past, right, vectors require coordinates and directions. So let's define some directions first. And we'll start off with I and J. And those will be reference directions or bases that are fixed in the ground. So in terms of these directions, this position vector can be written as the component in the I direction. And so that will be this distance. And that coordinate we can define as x. And then the component in the j direction, which we will define as y. So here, this vector can be written as x in the i direction plus y in the j direction. But as we talked about in the lecture, lecture on vectors, we can also describe this in terms of polar coordinates. Right? So here, let's define two new directions. Right? So let them be i2 and j2. And they will be oriented with an angle theta. And in particular, I2 is defined as the direction of this vector. Right? So if this vector were to move around, I2 would move around with it. And then J2 is perpendicular to that vector. So now, in terms of these directions, right, we'll also need the magnitude, which we can identify as R. Notice that this is a scalar. It doesn't have the underbar while this is a vector. So in terms of these polar coordinates, or the directions i2 and j2, the vector can be written as r in the i2 direction. So we have two different ways of writing this vector. And actually, there are a, a number of different ways. But we've identified two here um, in this lecture. So now, in general, how do we want to go about deciding which set of coordinates to, to choose. Well, my advice is to choose coordinates that, in some sense, best reflect the constraints, or best describe the constraints of the system. examples down below. And I will note that in each case I'm going to define the origin as O and the point that we're interested in will be A. So here the vector from O to A or the position of A is R of A with respect to O. And over here in this other system Right? The position of A with respect to O is given essentially the way I've drawn them with the same vector. Right? So I've tried to be careful here. Right? This vector and this vector are exactly the same. Right? But 
how should I choose to describe these vectors? Well, it depends on the constraints of the problem. So I will go ahead and identify directions fixed in the ground, I and J. And then I will also identify directions that move with the bar. Right, so that'll be I2 and J2. So these vectors will be inclined at an angle theta. Now, for the picture on the left, this bar has fixed length. Right, so it's a rigid length that rotates about 0. 0.0. Right, so the constraint here is the length of the bar. Right, so let's call that L. And because the length is constrained, the magnitude is constrained, right, it kind of makes sense to represent this in terms of polar coordinates. Right? So RA with respect to O would be L in the I2 direction. And then we have the coordinate theta, which would describe I2 with respect to the ground. Right? So again, this is kind of the natural representation for this system. Now, if I go over to the picture on the right, now we have a block that slides left and right, and that is offset by a distance d. So here, the natural constraint of the problem is not the length of the vector, right? Because that can change, nor is it the direction, right? Because the direction of this vector can change. Instead, the natural constraint is the velocity of this block, or, or the direction of change, right? So here, we can define x as the displacement of this block, right, in the horizontal direction, while d is the displacement of the block in the vertical direction. And the constraint here really is that the vertical displacement is constant. Right, so it's only the component in the i direction that changes. Right, so as a result, the natural coordinates for this representation would be x. And so that the directions that we use are i and j. Right, so here, x is the coordinate, d represents the constraint. Up here, theta is the coordinate and L represents the constraint. So again, we want to choose coordinates that are most convenient for the problem. Right? So the way that we describe position vectors really depends on the problem that we're dealing with. So now let's go and look at an example. Right? And in particular, position vectors can be chained together. Right? So here, what I've drawn are, are actually two different lengths. Right? So I have a point O, right? and then I have a point A, and I have a point B at the end of this second point. So we'll identify the length of this blue link is L2, right? the length of this gray link is L3, and what we'll really be interested in is the vector or the position of B with respect to O. So now this is actually a two degree of freedom mechanism, right? So there are two things that we need to know. And, and in particular, they are the, the angles of these links, right? So it doesn't make sense necessarily to write this vector just directly. Instead, let's take advantage of the constraints of this problem, namely the length of these two links, right? So here, instead of simply writing a B with respect to O, we'll kind of work through the linkage. And we'll write the vector from O to A, and then we'll write the vector from A to B. And of course, because of vector addition properties, right, we can add these two things together. Right, so that the position of B with respect to O is the position of A with respect to O, that's this first vector, plus the position of B with respect to A. And now, let's go and define these vectors. So, 
as always, right, we'll write i and j that are fixed in the ground. I'm actually going to do that twice. I mean, these are the same directions. I'm just because I want to identify the directions of these moving links explicitly. So let's say that link 2 has I2 and J2 associated with it. And then the angle here is going to be theta 2. While link 3 will actually, oops, will actually define the direction as I3 and J3. And notice that this angle, theta 3, is defined positive clockwise, while this angle, theta 2, is defined positive in the counterclockwise direction. So now, in terms of these directions and these constrained links, the position of B with respect to O can be written as L2 in the I2 direction plus L3 in the I3 direction. But if we want to write this in terms of, say, I and J fixed in the ground, then we'll need to take I2 and I3 and rewrite them in terms of I and J. So now going back to our transformations right, that we looked at uh, in a previous lecture, right, we can examine I2 and J2 and see that I2 is cosine of theta 2 in the I direction plus sine of theta 2 in the J direction. Likewise, kind of just for completeness, J2 is minus sine of theta 2 in the I direction plus cosine of theta 2 in the J direction. Looking at the third frame of reference, I3 is now cosine of theta 3 in the I direction, but because theta 3 is defined positive clockwise, if theta 3 again is positive, then I3 is kind of in the minus j direction. So we'll have minus sine theta 3 in the j direction. And likewise, j3 is plus sine of theta 3 in the i direction, and a cosine of theta 3 in the j direction. So here we've, write, we've, we've written these directions uh, back in terms of a common reference frame, namely i and j fixed in the ground. So, as a result, I can go and finally express the position of B with respect to O as L2 in the I2 direction. Well, that was cosine and sine in the J direction, plus L3 in the I3 direction. So that's cosine of theta 3 minus sine of theta 3 in the J direction. So finally, collecting the coefficients uh, in the i direction and the j direction, the position of b with respect to o is L2 cosine of theta 2 plus L3 cosine of theta 3 in the i direction, and then L2 sine of theta 2 minus L3 sine of theta 3 in the j direction. So here, if we were to go and ask, well, what's the component in the I direction? And what's the component in the J direction? Right? This position of B, well, this would be the component in the I, and that'd be the component in the J. So both angles, theta 2, are required to determine the position of B. this vector B with respect to O. Okay, so that's just a quick introduction to position, right? We will obviously do a lot more 
with, with position in, in the coming lectures as we talk about the kinematics of machines. Right, but that's just, again, a quick introduction. Um, positions are vectors, right, and we really want to express those vectors in such a way that reflects the constraints of the problem. And I guess that's the key point here, is that our mechanisms and our linkages will always have constraints. And we would like to make those constraints, whether they be fixed length, like we see here, or maybe a fixed sliding direction, like we saw in the previous slide. We'd like to make those constraints as, as evident and, and natural as possible. So that's it for today. Uh, short lecture, but thanks for, for joining in. Take care. Bye.